Amen. Make sure my phone is off there. <laughs> Good to be in church today. Amen. Thought it was kind of funny. My wife sang the song, first song was about shaking the foundations, and it's like, I don't think she intended that, but I wonder how many people were singing songs about shaking in Alaska today. Amen. Quite a experience, and uh, it's funny how, you know, this is Alaska. We just, okay, that was big. That, that made a mess. Okay, let's clean it up. All right, back to work. And um, it, it, does, uh, it does scare us. It, it does concern us. Um, but three days later, we got business to do, and back to it, and... Uh, so that's just us. We deal with it and move on. But uh, just thank the Lord that nobody was injured or hurt. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, thank the Lord that uh, not a tremendous amount of significant da- da- uh, damage, um, but uh, some inconvenience for sure. All those falling rocks all- along the pass. I don't know if you saw the picture of that semi-truck with a rock right through the cab of it. Um, man, that's scary. Um, but the Lord kept his angels around people, and uh, we, we get to just clean up, and that's a blessing. So, so glad you're here, and uh, thankful for the word of the Lord. John 1.14. Thankful to all of those that are listening via Facebook. Um, We have a little delay in our video and audio, and uh, our video audio guy is going to be on that, and we'll clear that up, so um, it it will be taken care of, but we're glad you're all here. John 1 and 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I was in prayer this week, and the Lord laid this message on my heart. I really feel like I have a message for somebody. I don't know who this is for. I don't know who is listening that God is going to be speaking to, but it is a direct message from God. It is for you, and I thank God for it today. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We ask you, God, to let this word minister to each and every heart that is here. Speak to us in this house today. Help us, God, as we reach to you today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you were to poll or you were to put a question out as to what the greatest desire of any Christian would be, I'm sure that probably at the very top of the the, the desire of of the poll would be that every Christian desires to be like Jesus. Yeah. That, that would probably be my number one. I want to be like Jesus. It is a desire expressed in our way of talking. We all say in one manner or another that we want to be like Jesus. We talk about I want to grow, I want to mature, but really what that points to or what that is saying is I want to become more like Jesus. That's what we're after. Being more like Jesus encompasses more than we realize. We think of the many virtues when we think about becoming like Jesus. We we think about being more loving towards people, having more patience and kindness towards people, and, and being more gracious. And we think of those things when we say, I want to be more like Jesus. We think of that. I, I want to love people more. I want to, I, I want to be more kind. I, I want to do those things. Everyone in this place would raise their hands and say, I want to be more like Jesus. I, I want to be more like Jesus. There is a method that he uses to help us become more like him. He has a way of teaching us so that we can clearly understand how we can be more like him. God does not want us to miss those lessons because they are imperative to us that we learn them so that we can become more like him. 
in learning the lessons that he teaches us, we learn to become more like him. I want to bring to you today the word that God has given me to help you understand what grace is. I'm preaching to you today. The title of my message is Grace and Truth. Grace and Truth. I hope today that you will see clearly what God is speaking to you today about grace. That to be like Jesus, we have to exercise the giving of grace. We're good at receiving it. We're great about receiving it. But to understand grace, we must give grace. John 1 and 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How many of us here today are familiar with that verse? Others never heard this verse before. How many of us today would say we understand that verse? Okay, I, I, we read it. In, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory of as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We understand that verse, okay? We understand the power of the statement concerning the incarnation of our mighty God. That the word that was in the beginning was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory. Our God that was in the beginning, that created everything, that spoke the worlds into existence, came and became flesh and dwelt among us. That God, the only singular God in the beginning, became flesh and dwelt among us. We love this powerful scripture. We love that scripture. That is a powerful, powerful scripture. But tucked at the end of this scripture is something that we often overlook. It says that this God that was in the beginning, that came and became flesh among us, whose glory we beheld, that God was full of grace and truth. Now, how many understand what that is saying? Good. I thought I understood it. I've read it many, many times. Jesus was full of grace and truth. That is so evident when we read the Scripture, that Jesus was full of grace and truth. But may I propose to you today that you cannot understand this portion of Scripture by reading it. You, you cannot understand this portion of Scripture by reading it. I believe that this portion of Scripture, that last portion, is a revelation. I believe that it is a revelation and that in order to understand the revelation of this scripture, you have to live this scripture. You've got to live this scripture. I, I would propose to you that the only way to understand this scripture is through your life. The only way to really understand what God is speaking to us today in this house, hear me. Is through your life. You that are watching on the internet today, you too can say to yourself that you want to be like Jesus. You're watching right now because there's something inside you that wants to grow and wants to become more like Him, that wants to, wants to, to, to become more like Jesus. You desire that. You're listening for a purpose. You're watching for a reason because you hunger after God. But may I say to you today that you yourself cannot understand the Scripture until you experience it. I, I, I implore you to stay with us through this Scripture. Don't come off the Internet. God wants to speak to you right now, and God wants to say something to you right now. Listen to what God has to say to us today. To help us understand this scripture, we have got to see grace in action. 
are one of the greatest examples of this, of grace and action, is found in the story of the life of a man named Jonah. It is his life that reveals to us a better understanding of this passage of Scripture. I'd like for you to turn to Jonah, looking at the very first two verses in, chap in chapter 1 of Jonah. It says here, it starts right off. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittiah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. This was the commandment of God to his prophet Jonah. Go to Nineveh and cry against them. Cry against this city. Call that city to repentance. I want you to go. I want you to preach the word. Cry against the city and call them to repentance. Now, any man of God would want this. Really, honestly, yeah. any man of God would, would, this would be amazing yes. to have God say to you, this is where I want you to go. You are called specifically to go to that place, and this is the message that I want you to preach. Yeah. You cannot get it any better than that. Yeah. It, it doesn't come to you any more silver plated. I can't tell you how many times I wish God would just send a voice or a letter down from heaven. Just say this. Just do this. Yeah. Jonah had it made. Yes. Go, to Go to Nineveh and preach to them. Say it to them. Not only amazing that God would do that, but to know that God's going to turn that city upside down. Yes. Jonah 1.3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare there and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish for the, from the presence of the Lord. Jonah refused the calling of God and he ran. Jonah refused to go to Nineveh and to preach to the people that the message that God gave him to preach. Now, that, first of all, that does not make sense. That, that, that is not, if you're reading along and you haven't ever heard this story, when you get to here, it's just like, okay, what are we talking about? God gave a call to his man, to the man of God to go preach. The man of God got the message, and the man of God just took off, and he ran. He ran. We need to understand Nineveh a little bit better to understand what is going on here. Now, I, I Googled, and you can Google after the service is over, about Nineveh. Nineveh, according to information on the Internet, was the famous capital of ancient Assyria. Previous cities like Ashur and Kela were ancient capitals of, Ass of Assyria, but Nineveh became the most famous in the 7th century B.C. when King Sennacherib made Nineveh his capital the empire expanded and became prosperous. Nineveh was founded by Nimrod in Genesis. It, it, was, it was a powerful city, but what's more peculiar about Nineveh is that it was made most famous, most powerful, most glorious during the reign of Sennacherib. Now, those of you that know your scripture, you realize that Sennacherib is the one that went unto Israel and besieged Judah, Jerusalem, and was going to destroy it. He sent his army there and Sennacherib sent his, his, uh, his lead guy uh, to, to bring accusations and, and all kinds of, 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 of things against God. He went there to curse God. He went there to cause fear in the people and to take them away captive. They, they had been oppressed by, uh, Israel had been oppressed by uh, Syria many years. This, this was a very evil king. There was great evil in the city of Nineveh. 
God said in our opening scriptures that the evilness that was in the city of Nineveh was so great that it came to the attention of God. It came to God's attention. There's a lot of sin on this earth. There's a lot of cities that are steeped in sin. But boy, this city named Nineveh, it has come to my attention and it has risen up above all of the others like Sodom and Gomorrah. It has risen up and I am going to destroy it. Yeah. There, was, there was a great amount of city in, or sin in that city. And so Jonah is the man with the word of repentance for that city. He is a man of God, called of God, to speak a word of God. But Jonah had no desire to go. He has no desire to do what God has called him to do. Why would a man, a man of God, reject such an important call? Why would he do that? Maybe Jonah was, was fearful. He knew the wickedness and the evilness of that city, and he knew their, their hostility towards everybody around them. Maybe Jonah figured, if I go to Nineveh, and if I go preach in Nineveh, they're just going to take me captive. They're going to put me in prisoner. They will torture me. They will think I'm a spy come from Israel. And so they're going to torture me. They're going to do all kinds of things to me. Maybe Jonah had some concern over that. Maybe he was worried that these things would happen to him. There was a reason that he refused to go. There was a reason. And so God does what God does. He gets the attention of the man of God. I called you to go. You're the one that I want to go. Let me get your attention. And so of all of the attention getters that I read in all of the Bible, Jonah's is number one. It's number one. God has Jonah thrown into the ocean, and a big fish swallows Jonah. Now, my friend, if that doesn't get your attention... Casey, I don't know about you, but I know about me. I like to go fishing. I like to catch fish. I like to bring fish up. But I don't want to be the bait. I, I don't want to be swallowed by a fish. I, don't, I do not get in the ocean, and I do not go scuba diving. I have pulled up some big ling cod, and there might be something down there big enough to swallow me. I will not go down there. No, no. God gets Jonah's attention. He gets his attention. Jonah repents. He says, I'm sorry, God did wrong. Fish swims over to Nineveh and spits him out there on the shores of Syria. Jonah 3, 1 through 4. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, All right, God doesn't change anything. Yeah, I, I've said this before. When you refuse to do what God says to do, you don't just get to go around that thing. You're, you're not going to get to say, okay, let's just pin that little thing right up here, and we'll come back to this later, God. Let's, but for now, let's just go on our merry little way. God doesn't do that. He didn't let Jonah do that. He spit him right out on Nineveh, and then this is what God says to do. Verse 2, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach it to Preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. That's a long city to walk through. I could walk through Anchorage in less than three days. That's how big, that's how big Nineveh is. Three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah went on a three-day journey preaching through the streets of Nineveh that God was going to destroy Nineveh in forty days. You got forty days. Get your house in order. Get things ready, because I'm going to destroy. God is going to destroy. Now Nineveh obeyed the voice of God, Jonah 3, 5. 
So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. Wow! Wow! Man, we're having a hard time with the city of 6,000. We can walk through Soldatna in about a half hour. This is a three-day journey. Imagine the multitude of people. Imagine the anointing that is on Jonah. Imagine the anointed word that has gone forth unto the people of Jonah. And from the greatest of them unto the least of them, every one of them heard the word of God and repented. They said, I don't want to die. I don't want to go. I, I, I don't want the judgment of God on my life. I've heard the word of God. I've heard what God said he's going to do. I believe that God is true to his word. He's not even our God. But I believe that this God that is speaking this message has so much power that we're going to repent. Yes. We're going to repent. You realize that he's not even the God of Syria. This is a foreign God to them. But he is the only God. He is the true God. And you can bow yourself down to anything you want, and it'll never give you any understanding or correction at all. But God will. The true God will bring you a word that will strike your heart, strike your spirit. It'll cause you to realize that what God is saying is true. And so the king himself puts on sackcloth and ashes. The whole countryside goes into repentance. Even the animals are not allowed to eat or drink. God saw their repentance. Jonah 3.10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them because them, and he did it not. God said, Look, they repented. They have turned. Yeah. They have quit oppressing the poor. They have quit doing the evil that I told them that they should stop doing. Yeah. They, they, have, they have come under my word. Yeah. They have repented. Because of these people repenting, God changed his mind and removed his judgment from them. Yeah. Now, we're talking today about grace and truth, uh -huh. okay? So here we have an example of grace and truth. Truth said to the city of Nineveh that you have sinned. You have done wrong. You, you, have, you, you are under my judgment. That's what truth said. Truth said you deserve just punishment because what you're doing is evil and wrong. The sin showed very clearly that the punishment that God was going to bring was just. God was not being unjust. God was being just. That's truth. That's truth. But grace looks at the person who did the sinning. Grace looks at them and says, but I don't want to destroy you. The grace of God looked at the people of Nineveh and said, it's not right that I should destroy them even though they're sinning without the opportunity to repent. So I will send a voice to them. I will send a man to them. I will send someone to them to call them to repentance. Grace says, I am not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Grace looks at the person and says, but I love them even in their sin. But I love them even in their disobedience. But I do not want them to fall under my judgment. Therefore, I will send them a word to repent. Now, how many here today understand that? You on the internet, come on, raise your hand. You understand what I've just said to you. God looks at us. He looks at, he looks at who we are. We understand that. Yes. All right. Amen. Now, remember, I told you that this is not something that you can get through a lesson. It has to be lived. Amen. To understand this, you have to experience. Yes. To have it as part of your life makes this lesson so real that you understand what it is to be like Jesus. I started this off saying, we want to be like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. And so to understand this, we got to go right back to Jonah. We got to go back to Jonah. 
Why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? What was it that what was it about him? Why did he run and not want to go and preach to the people? Obviously, the results were spectacular. Obviously, this would be the greatest thing any evangelist, prophet, preacher, anybody would love, love to see this happen. Jonah 4 and 1. Now, you got to understand context about what we're talking about here. Okay, so what has happened is Jonah has gone and Jonah has preached and the city has repented. Okay, that's where we're at when we're about to read this verse. Jonah 4.1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarsus. This is the reason I left in the first place. When you asked me to go in the beginning, I told you this was why I did not want to go. Why? For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah refused to go because he knew that God would forgive them. Yes. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh because he knew if I go there and I preach to them, they're going to repent. Mm -hmm. You see, Jonah hated these people. Yes. He yes. hated them. They had killed and they had oppressed in Israel. They had done all kinds of evil things. We don't know the life story of Jonah. We don't know how this nation had affected his own personal life. But we know this. Jonah wanted them to die. He wanted them to die. Jonah wanted God to utterly destroy them. He went up on a high cliff. You keep reading. He goes up on a high cliff overlooking the city, and he is waiting for the judgment of God to come down. All Jonah does is he goes through the city, and he preaches three days. Yet in 40 days, God's going to destroy this place. Jonah leaves and goes up onto a high hill. He does not see Nineveh repent. He doesn't see it. But he goes up there, and he waits. 40 days come and go, and there is no destruction. And Jonah gets He's ticked off. He is mad. He got so angry. Now, how many of us here today would condemn Jonah for his actions? He's a man of God. Oh, come on. Honestly, you wouldn't condemn him? God told him to go preach to a people. He is a prophet of God. He's got a responsibility and a duty. I'll condemn him. Come on. You're going to let a whole city go to hell? Because, because you got some stubborn anger? I'll condemn him. I'll raise my hand. I'm not afraid. Yeah. How many would say Jonah was absolutely wrong in what he did? How many would at least say his attitude was wrong? Yes. Yeah, Raise your hand on the internet. Come on. We're talking about the man of God called to deliver the word of God. What do you get to pick and choose who you're going to say? You, you get to pick and choose what you're going to do when you're called to God and God gives you a direct voice? When God gives you a direct word, you just, just kind of say, well, no, that's not what I'm going to do. No. He was a prophet of God and was deliberately selected to tell Nineveh. God, God didn't say, okay, I understand your issues here, Jonah. Let me go over here and talk to this one. Now you go, you tell him. Nope. God didn't do that. His preaching resulted in the entire city repenting. Who would not condemn Jonah for being mad that an entire city repented? 
okay, I, I, I can get it. I don't want to go there. I'm angry. I'm mad at them. I got it. But who wouldn't condemn him when he saw the city repent and be angry? Angry that they repented. Angry that God didn't destroy him. Look at God and say, I am right to be angry because I knew you would do this. I, I'll be the first. I'll be the first. A whole city that God says I'm going to destroy, and you look at that whole city and you say, let them die. That's just wrong. I said that I believe in order to understand this story and understand what God is speaking to us today, you've got to live this. This is a revelation. It's not an understanding. You understand it's a revelation that comes to you. You will receive the revelation about grace when it is you that has to give the grace. All I ever wanted in my life was to be married and to have a family. That's all I ever wanted. I began praying and asking God to give me, uh, lead me in the, to the person that I was to marry when I was 16 years old. I began, honestly, I began praying about that. I didn't ask God for where to work. I did not ask God for money. I didn't ask God for position. I didn't ask God for any of that. What I wanted out of life, Scott, what I wanted more than anything, I just wanted to be married and I just wanted to have a family. When God gave my wife and I our first little girl, our lives were forever changed. With each and every one of their arrivals, we were so blessed. We were so blessed. We both treasured what Jesus gave to us in our family. What an amazing thing it was to have me and my wife and my beautiful three little girls all together living in a 10 by 55 trailer house. It didn't matter what we lived in. Yep. Sister Juanita, it just didn't matter. That was home. Yep. And that was my life. That's what I loved. And, and that's what I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. To me, I, I was a bazillionaire. Mm -hmm. I had everything. Mm -hmm. My daughters became my life. My whole weeks off were spent playing one game or another, hide-and-seek. We cleared out, when we finally got into our home, we cleared out the whole living room, and we would play dodgeball in the living room. We did. They, the girls would line up against the wall, and we had this pillow, this little pillow, and I would throw it at them, and they'd dodge, and then the last one standing, I'd get up there, and we, 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 we played hide-and-seek. We played, I mean, we just played everything. I did very little, um, I did very little discipline. Um, I was the gymnasium. I was not the discipliner, but we had a referee. We had one, and she was willing to discipline. But I was just so engrossed in the joy of being a dad. I loved being a dad. It was the greatest thing in my life. We kept our home clean, and we kept our home pure. We didn't watch anything stronger than Pooh Bear. That was it. And we watched Pooh Bear a lot. We listened to Adventures in Odyssey all the time. Got all the cassette tapes, and we would listen on Moody Broadcast. They had it at a certain time, and, and then they had the Sugar Hill Gang, and we would listen to that, and uh, we did all of that. At nights, we would have our story time. My wife would get a uh, book, and we would read the story, and we'd all listen, and then we would have our devotion. We would all sp uh, spend time in prayer, and, and then we would say goodnight, and we would go to bed. And that happened every day without fail it happened every day our lives were a storybook I, I can't think of a single thing that I would ever change in raising our kids it was truly a fairy tale life together but one day I turned around 
And I had teenage daughters. And life began to change, and new challenges arose. Soon my oldest was off to college. We wanted to send her to a Christian college, a place where she would be around other kids that were good and, and have good influences. And so we sent her to Detroit, Michigan, to a Christian college that was there with uh, Brother Roland Baker's uh, church. She was going to study there to become an accountant. We began to get rumblings of trouble before she ever left. There were friends, there were boyfriends, there were people that we did not approve of. There was secrecy and things going on behind our back that we would find out about and, and just anger, just anger, just, just, are you kidding me? Once we left Detroit and settled her in, the real issues began. We started getting phone calls. I had a friend that lived down there and he'd call me up and, hey Mike, Man, I am really sorry to bug you, but I really need to let you know. They were the kind of phone calls that I didn't want. The issues that she was getting into brought my wife and I so much grief and so much anger. Pretty soon she got kicked out of the Christian school and she was on her own. My daughter is homeless. She's sleeping in her car. She's going from friends to friends, house, couch to couch. All kinds of stuff happening. She decided to try things that we told her never to do. She went to the clubs. She went to the parties. She was immersed in the lifestyle of the partiers, not in Soldatna, Alaska, in Detroit, Michigan, my daughter, my daughter, beautiful girl, raised her, played hide and seek, dodgeball, rode snow machines, everything, my little girl, is homeless in Detroit, Michigan. She's, she's down in Four Mile and in, in that area where the slums are. My, my daughter. You know how many people are killed in Detroit, Michigan? What do you do, Valerie? You get a phone call, Izzy's down in Chicago and Southside. You know how much angst comes up in a dad? You, you know how much anger you get? I, I mean, just angry. You want to go down there and you want to really hurt someone. I am a nice guy. Do you cross the line on my family? And who am I angry at, sister? Who am I angry at? Sister Mary Irene, I'm, I'm angry at my daughter because I can't point to anybody else. And I, I call, my wife calls and is talking to her. I can't, I can't say a word. I can't speak to her. Because if anything comes out of my mouth, it's just venom. I'm so mad. I'm so angry. More than anything, I am hurt. I am, I am crushed over what she is doing. I didn't raise you like that. I, I didn't raise you like that. That's not what I taught you. How can you do this? It got so bad. Brandon, inside of me, I prepared myself. I'm not making this up. I'm being as truthful as I can to you. I prepared myself for a phone call from the police to come and identify the body. I was ready. Baby, I was ready. I had put calluses and I, I had steeled myself. I was ready. They're going to call. They're going to say, this beautiful little white girl down in the middle of Detroit, around all of that? 
One day my wife got a call from my daughter. And she was she was pregnant. And it just broke me. It broke my wife. It broke my daughter. Thank God it broke my daughter. I can't thank God enough for that little girl. She's a treasure of my life. I don't know who you are. I don't know who's listening, but that little baby became the salvation of my life, just healed me in so many ways. I thank God for that little girl. She was pregnant. So I sent my wife down to her, get my daughter, and she flew down to Detroit, and they packed up her belongings, put them all in her car, and they drove her car across from Detroit to Seattle, put the car there in Seattle on the barge to come up to Alaska, and they flew up here. While they were in transit, I was home alone. My daughter is safe now, and so... My concern over whether or not I'm going to get a phone call from the police, that's gone. My, my concern over what next is gone. It's gone. And so all of that stuff that's inside me just starts turning and boiling and seething, and now it's just anger. It's just anger. For a week, I became more and more angry at her over what she had done to me. I got to the point that I really didn't know how I was going to react when she came in and I first saw her. I, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I sat there in that airport in Anchorage. They had benches out there. and You're looking down the breezeway. And, and I sat there and I know here they come. I'm seeing people filing in and I'm just watching. And then around the corner came my little girl. My heart melted. That's my baby. That's my little girl. There she is. I couldn't help it. Tears running down my face. I ran to her and I grabbed her. I was so thankful to see her. A month passed, two months passed, and we settled into life. And I was in prayer one day. I've had time to think about this, and it just hasn't gone away from me. I'm venting in prayer in my anger to God. I'm venting to Him. God, thank you for delivering her. Thank you for bringing her here. I love my daughter. But God, you've got to make her feel the shame and the pain that I feel and that of what I went through. She's got to bear the brunt of what I faced. She's got to feel, God, you've got, you've got to come down on her and you've got to make her feel it, God. Sister Crystal, I'm in prayer and I'm telling God, God, you've got to do something to her. And as sure as I am standing here, as clear as if my wife were to speak to me right now, God spoke to me. And he said, you don't know me. Oh, that was, that was, that was a dagger in my heart. You don't know me. And God took me directly to that scripture in John. And he said, I was full of grace and truth. You want to bring judgment on your daughter and I will not bring judgment on her. She repented and she has turned from her sin and I will not bring retribution on her. And you don't know me. Oh, oh God. Oh church. Oh. God taught me right there what it is to understand grace and truth. It was then that I received a full revelation of this scripture. You here today have raised your hand when you said that Jonah was wrong for his hatred of the people of Nineveh. 
You said, rightly so, that Jonah did wrong for not wanting to deliver the message of salvation to Nineveh. We all have looked at him and judged him and his fault because he was so angry that they repented and that God forgave them. He literally wanted them to be destroyed. But here, who here today in this house or listening online has stood in the exact situation in your life? Who here has stood in this exact place? Somebody hurt you. Somebody did something in your life that brought you pain in a way that you could never even imagine. Somebody has done something. Somebody said something. Somebody did something to you. Some of you were abused. Some of you were molested. Some of you have been told from the time that you're a child that you'll never amount to anything. People have been mean and have hurt you and have been vicious in your life. You've had things done to you that nobody in all of their life should ever have done to them. And you think that you are righteous in your anger and your hatred. And God is saying, but I am not willing that any should per perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I'm here to tell you today that God is calling to you today and saying to you in this house and you that are listening online, forgive. Oh, can't you let go? Can't you look at the thing that is just burned inside you? Can't you look at the hurt that has held you for so long? And look at the face of the one that had did it. And let go and forgive. And let go and forgive. You told me that you wanted to be like Jesus. You raised your hand and you said that it was your desire, your chiefest desire as a Christian to be like Jesus. Well, then can I tell you the story of Jesus? This was a man that had done no wrong, that loved and cared and healed and gave so that people could have life. But there was a group of people that hated him and they wanted his death and they captured him. And they crucified him. But this man, Jesus, our God manifest in flesh, hanging on that cross, looked at a group of people that had, had, had accused him. This group of people that had said, we want you dead and had accomplished their means by putting him on the cross. This one, while they're mocking him while they're looking at him, while they're saying he couldn't be God. He, if, he, 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 there's no way he could be who he said he was. If you really are the Christ, then come down from that cross. This man, Christ Jesus, who you say that you want to be like, looked at those that were murdering him and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can we stand today? I don't know what you went through. I don't know what you suffered. I don't understand the situations in your life. This much I know. You want to be like Jesus? You've got to learn this lesson. You've got to learn this. I did not want to preach this message tonight. That is so personal to me and that hits home closer than you can imagine. And I did not want to preach this message. And I don't know who is listening. I don't know who out there on the internet is listening. I don't know who's going to listen a month from now, who's going to hear this message, but it's for you. And God is trying to speak to you. And God is trying to tell you that you've got to let go of your hatred and you got to let go of your anger. And you got to let go of your bitterness. And you got to let go of what is inside you. Because if you don't, what you want to happen to them is going to happen to you. Because it's eating you up every day. It's killing you inside. It's destroying you. But Jesus said, let it go. How do I let it go? Here's how you let it go. You raise your hands right now. You open your heart up to God right now and you say, God, take this out of me.
Take out of me the hurt. Take out of me the pain. Take out of me the anger. Take out of me all of those things that are inside me. Get them out of me. You cannot heal yourself. Only Jesus can. Be honest with him right now and let that out. If you're here today and you want to become more like Jesus and you desire to walk in his steps, then I open these altars. Would you come and would you pray? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. 